We're in this brand new series, and here's what I want to let you know, because we're talking about a lot of controversial stuff. We ask people, hey man, ask your friends, like what do they want to ask God? And so we tallied up all the folks that turned in questions, and that's what we're going through in this series. And this one, I just want to let you know, wherever you're at, um, I respect your journey. I respect your process. I just want to ask you to give me a hearing because I think it'll be informative and helpful. And I want to start with a question. How many in your home, in your apartment, in your house, you are familiar with the five second rule? Anybody familiar with the five second rule? Yeah, you guys know what this is, right? This is where, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be at your house. If, if something falls on the floor, you've got five seconds to pick that up and you can still chomp that thing, man, that's okay. Well, some of you might remember the show Mythbusters. This is a few years ago. And they wanted to take a look at this myth and say, is that really true? Like, is that, is that good advice? Is that homespun wisdom actually helpful to people? What happens if something falls on the floor within five seconds? Is it still okay to eat? And what they found out was it had a lot less to do with the time it was on the floor and you guessed it, what was on the floor, okay? So whatever it falls in. So if you got a nice, delicious, juicy hamburger patty and that thing falls on the floor and it's relatively clean, you're probably good. You probably leave it there for a couple minutes. You can still eat that thing, right? I know that's what I'd do. Um, However, if the dog recently peed right there and there's a pile of toenail clippings, it really doesn't matter how long it's on there. You're still gonna get some of that when you take a bite. So uh, they exposed that myth that, nah, even though that's kind of like normal wisdom, it's not really about how long, it's about what's on there. So we're gonna look at some of our assumptions today. We're gonna ask some harder questions. We're gonna ask it of the Bible, and we're gonna ask, I hope, a lot of good questions of ourselves. Jesus said in John 14, verse six, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father but through me. Now, what's really important is it wasn't Jesus' followers who said that. Because I don't know about you, but I feel like Christians can get a lot of things wrong. Like if it's just Christians that said it, but Jesus didn't actually say it, I'm like, y'all really believed in Y2K, all right? And if, I, I feel like that went all right. So there's, there's just been things through the years that Christians, I don't know. But if Jesus said it, that adds a new level of weight. And when Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me, that can get some of us very concerned because we've got tensions with that idea. Especially in this day and age, there's all kinds of things that begin to bubble up in us. First, did Jesus really say that? Like that's the first tension. Would, would he say that? I feel like we're in a, a very tolerant society and for him to, to use that exclusive of, of exclusive of language, I'm just wondering if he really said that. Here's another tension that you might have. If he did say that, what does that mean for people that have never heard the name of Jesus? Like, what does that mean for the man in the bush? That like, dude, he's never, he's not even gonna encounter anybody that knows that name. What does it mean for those kinds of people? And then another tension, what does that imply about God? Because it seems like we could infer from that, if that's really true, then it seems like there's folks that are just disqualified from grace on the basis of their genealogy or the history of their people. So like, can that, and does that mean God's not fair? Does that mean like he's, he's not even given some folks a chance at grace? And that can make me look at me and say, well, I've got a lot of opportunity. I've got a lot of access, but does that mean God is somehow immoral because he's given me more opportunity than someone, maybe even only hypothetically across the sea? So those are the tensions, nothing too big that we're talking about today. Uh, Let me begin with a little reminder to us. It's so important that we come down to earth, so to speak, anytime we're talking about big issues like this. Here's the first reminder. In the pages of scripture, God tells us, just so you know, in the book of Deuteronomy, he says, just so you know, I'm not telling you everything. I think that's really important, okay? Because sometimes, especially people of faith, they can act like God has said more about things than he has. And I think sometimes we misrepresent God because of the way we talk about certain things as though, man, that's kind of verbatim in the Bible when sometimes that's just an inference or that's what maybe we heard somebody say, but it's really important that God tells us, I'm not telling you everything. There's all kinds of stuff. I've told you some things, that's the stuff in the Bible, but there's all kinds of stuff. The Bible isn't just an encyclopedia on everything and every way God operates. It's not his purpose that we know every way he operates. He just says, I'm telling you, there's things that you don't know. 
Here's another thing I really think that we need to understand. It's important if you're a person of faith that we only say what God has said and not what he hasn't said. Okay, what I mean by that is, as, as, just as a preacher, but even as a Christian, if God hasn't said something on it, I should only focus on what he has. And I can say, I don't know because God didn't write that down, but I can tell you this is what he has said. And then a third way that maybe we need to humble ourselves. And that is by saying, hey, um, you probably know a lot of things, but there's more things that you know nothing about, okay? So let's just take even a normal human lifespan. Let's say you, you make it to 80. Now in that time, you may have been able to study you may have been able to become like an expert in like five areas, right? Maybe you know multiple languages. Maybe you know the history of this certain kind of people, right? Maybe you, you know a lot about even galaxies and the cosmos or whatever. But at the end of the day, you know maybe a lot about a very little. Because think about how many other things there are to know, right? I mean, just think about the topics that exist that you are even aware of. Things like marine biology, Okay, things like different kinds of diseases from the past that there used to be. There's all kinds for, for, for every one of us. We may know a lot about three things, but we know nothing about most things or very, very little. Now consider all the things that are there that you don't even know are there. In other words, you're just aware of the categories you know about, but then there's all these categories that you don't even know exist. You, you don't even have understanding that that's actually an entire field. God knows all of it. And we know a very little. So I just think it's really healthy for us to remember, honey, I'm sure you're smart, but are you really seriously considering how much there is to know and how much of that to know you don't even know there is to know? Yeah, it's a lot. So we should feel very like humbled uh, when we think about stuff like that. So, but let's start with, instead of starting, you know, kind of in the cognitive Let's just start in the relational. Because here's the first question. Do I believe that God loves me? I really think we have to start there. Because if I don't believe God loves me, I don't know that I'm too concerned about the man in the bush. I don't know that I really care who he loves, where. If he doesn't love me, and I'm not pretty convinced, I'm not really gonna feel compelled that someone else should know that he loves them. Here's what God does. See, God always goes first. And this is what he says in Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us. How did he do it? He didn't just say, I love you. He didn't send you a Christmas card. This is what he did. He said, he showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. See, God says, I'm gonna solve your problem before you even know you have a problem. I wanna do something for you. You don't even know there, that this is a thing yet, but I'm gonna make it happen because of my great love for you because I don't want you in peril. Now, in case there's any confusion, I just want to make sure everybody sees this. So even if you don't believe the Bible's true, you're still able to say, but I know the Bible says this. Okay, so 1 Timothy 2, verse 3, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. We need to know God's heart. That's a really important thing for us to understand anytime you approach the Bible, because here's what's going to happen. The way you approach the Bible is going to have a lot to do with the way you interpret what it's saying. If you're coming from a place where you kind of presuppose, remember what presuppositions are there? They're the ideas that undergird everything else that we're thinking. If you presuppose that God's just kind of mad, God's just kind of miffed, and he's annoyed with people, and he's waiting for them to get their act together so they can come to him, um, that's a, you're going to read the scriptures a very different way than if you start with the idea God is trying to, he's, he's doing everything he can to get us to himself. He's not trying to pe keep people out. He's trying to get people in. Like that is his agenda. That is his objective. And that's what we learn from the scripture. So here's question number two. Are most religions mostly the same? That's, a, that, that's really, a, that's common uh, folklore, things that people would say today. That's something you'd hear at a dinner party. Hey man, you know, there's some differences, but for the most part, most religions are mostly the same, especially the big ones, right? They, they agree about, you know, love people and be nice and, and all that kind of stuff. Is that really true? Does that statement hold water? That's what we want to ask with this question. Um, you may, if you were a Mythbusters watcher, you may remember that there were some other things that they tried to solve, okay? Such as, is it really true that coffee will sober you up? 
If you get really drunk, okay, and you're like not sober, somebody starts handing you cups of coffee, hey man, come on, come back down, here we go. Is that gonna work? And here's what they found out, that doesn't work. Two things that do work is rigorous exercise and lots of slaps in the face. (laughs) So just so you know, on the authority of the Mythbusters, next time you're really mad at somebody for drinking too much, just tell them you're helping them out, okay? Just, Just go for it and I'm sure they'll really appreciate it. That'll be helpful. Um, but there, there's, there's this idea, hey man, all roads ultimately lead to the same place. It really doesn't matter which version you do. As long as you do one sincerely, you're going to wind up at the same place. Here's the problem with that. All of the religions we're talking about actually say that's not true. That every one of them claims exclusivity. They're saying, actually, it's not those. It's us. Now, Christians get the bad rap for it. Really, they, every, it seems like most other religions operate with some level of impunity. You can't really say anything about them, but you can, you can take it to Christians all the time. Like, well, they're so exclusive. Jesus was exclusive. Let's admit that. But let's also admit, if you're saying other religions aren't, I just want to humbly submit, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Okay, Because anyone that does their homework realizes these, these folks are claiming radically different things. And when they claim them, they're saying, and this is true and this isn't true. Okay, let me give you some examples. So if you're a Hindu, here's what you believe. You believe God is not personal. You believe that everything is God in a sense, okay? That means the carpet here, this is God. Um, The lights up there, that's God. You're God, but so is the chair, so is your car, so is your toilet. I mean, everything is God if you're you're a Hindu. I'm not trying, I'm not like poking fun. I'm just saying that's, that's how it's understood, but it's definitely not a person. It's not a guy or a gal that you can talk to. Now, if you're a Buddhist, you don't really know, but really you're more concerned about removing all of your desires because you think pain is a result of desires. Now, what's interesting about Buddhists, they have a riff on the story of, of the prodigal son. And some of you may be Buddhists, you may even know this. What's different about how that ends though is instead of the son having a robe thrown around their back and a ring put on their finger and it accepted back into the father's arms, Father makes the son a slave. And can we just clarify, those are different endings. And that means different things. That's gonna gonna shape how you're thinking about that. If you're a Muslim, here's what you know for sure. You've been taught all your life, Jesus Christ is not the son of God, nor is he the Messiah. In fact, the Quran says that Allah has begot none. He has no son. That is the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches, which is Jesus Christ is the Messiah and is the son of God. Can we we just, whether or not you buy either one, can you just affirm they are saying the opposite things? They cannot both be right. In addition, one is saying you are forgiven by God absolutely freely because he loves you and because you can't save yourself. You could never work it off. You could never be good enough where your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. He says, that's not even how it works. You're going into a court of law when you, when you see God, okay? And he's not, just like when you go to see a real judge, how many when you've gone to a judge, they got out a little scale and put it you know, up there on their, on their desk thing and they started to weigh, well, here's all their good deeds. And here's all their baddies. Let's see which one. And then if your good deeds outweighed the bad, they were like, hey, congratulations. You're done, man. Go home. You know that's not how it works in a court of law. They're not asking, did their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds? They're just saying, did they do the bad deeds? And if they did, now they're in trouble. And what the Bible is saying, what Jesus is saying is, you can't save yourself from that. So what you need is you need a savior who's gonna sacrifice himself for you and pay the penalty for what you did and take the punishment so that you don't have to because you never could, you wouldn't survive it. Islam, and they would unapologetically say this, they're saying, no, you gotta be good. Now you can't, you won't know how good you are, you won't know if it's enough, but you just have to always be the best you can and good luck with that, I hope it works out well. Do you see how, As we evaluate this thing, they are not saying the same thing. They're contradicting one another. You can say, well, Carter, doesn't that just mean, um, you know, good for me because I can trust Jesus, but what about everybody else? I still don't like the fact that Jesus is being exclusive. And I would just bring you back to, 
dear heart, everybody's being exclusive because they're, they're proclaiming different things. The question is, where does the evidence fall? Can, can, can we just have a, a moment where we don't have to be emotional about it? We're just thinking it through rationally. Where's the evidence? Which one is most likely to be true? Because everyone is claiming exclusivity. Some of you remember um, in 2010, it was, it was all over the news. These 33 Chilean miners, they got stuck underground. Remember this? And they were under 700,000 tons of rock. And they were, how many was it? 2,300 feet down. And they were down there for 68 days. There's a great movie on it. And after the 68 days, the scientists and engineers, they figured out, hey, man, we can send this cylinder down that's only 21 inches in di- diameter. And if each one of these guys gets in, there, there's going to be a couple hour trip to get back up. But one at a time, if they get in this cylinder, we're going to be able to get them, you know, crawl through the rocks and it'll bring them right back up. Now, that's awesome. And I'm sure they were relieved. But what if there was one guy who looked at that cylinder and says, you know what? This is pretty exclusive and I don't like it. I don't like that you're telling me this is the only way out of this situation. You'd probably say, you respond to that person, um, sir, I don't know that you understand the situation you're in. This is the only way out, okay? The people up top, they can see everything and they're telling you there's no other way. It's this or nothing, brah. Now, of course, that's a little bit silly. No one would ever say that, but sometimes that's what we're saying to God when we take issue with Jesus saying, I'm the only way to the Father. So, are you, Jesus, I can't, I, can't, I can't handle that. And we begin to adopt a little bit of a moral superiority to him, which is, can I just tell you the ultimate irony that we're gonna be morally superior to the very one who is perfect and consequently going to save us. Um, but it's a little bit like this. You guys know this. There's all kinds of spiritual books written every year, right? And, and, and like there's legit ones, but there's kooky ones. You've seen the kooky ones, right? Like they're, they're, they're trips to heaven and, and spirits that tell you how to make money. And, and not that there's never books that are right about trips to heaven, but there's all kinds of stuff that are just, okay, <laughs> that's, that's a little goofy, even for goofy people. You know that those are there and that the publishers don't really care if they're true. They're not asking that question. They're saying, does it make money? Are people gonna buy this stuff? They're, they're, they're not, the publishers aren't there to verify if they're true. They're just saying, sure, man, yeah, do it, write it, we'll, we'll, we'll publish it. Let's imagine a fictional scenario, okay, where you've got three writers and they're gonna tell you about their trip to the moon so that you can do it too. Now, the first writer says, here's how you get to the moon. Most people don't know this, but if you climb Mount Everest, at the right time of the year, if you just get a running start and you jump, you will make it to the moon. Like you'll just right over there. And they're like, I'm a mathematician. I figured it out. That's how it'll work. Not dissing mathematicians. I know y'all would never say that, but that, that's, that's the book they publish. And now people write in, they're like, have you ever actually done this? No, I haven't done it, but that's the math. That's what will happen. Someone else says, nah, nah, that's not it. Here's what you do. You get yourself a big old spear gun and you shoot a wire straight at the moon, okay? It's gotta be a lot of wire, all right? You shoot it there, and then you can zip line all the way there. Now, that's, that's a little silly, and you say, oh, did you ever do it? No, I didn't do it, but I've, you know, I've just worked it out. I've worked out the physics of it. It'll work, okay? Now, there's a third gentleman who's an astronaut who actually went to the moon, and then came back and wrote it in a book. And he wrote about all the people that helped and all the training that was necessary and and how it had to work. Okay, can we just ask the question, which one is arrogant if they're gonna tell you how to get to the moon? Maybe the two that have the audacity to tell you how to get to the moon who have never been to the moon. Maybe it's them. So instead of Jesus being the arrogant one, can we remember Jesus has been dead and came back. That's a big deal, yo. Hello, that doesn't happen. Have you, have you known a lot of people that were dead and came back, all right, and, and said they were, it was gonna happen before it happened? In fact, they even told you, here's how they're gonna kill me. I'm gonna suffer, I'm gonna die. Three days later exactly, I'm gonna come right back. No one does that because only Jesus did that. It's pretty exclusive. He says, I've been outside the mine. I'm telling you, there's no other way out of this than this, and everyone else, bless their hearts, even if they're good people, they're still dead. They're still dead. Like they didn't come back to tell us 
This is how you do it. And so Jesus is pretty exclusive. And I think there's a degree to which it's arrogant to say, here's the path to a place I've never been, trust me. Can we just say that's a different thing than the son of God rising from the dead and saying, I've been dead. And by the way, I love you so much that I've paid with my very blood for you to be able to get there. It's just a different thing. And so this becomes a moral question. Part of us begins to suspect, can I trust Jesus to do right by other people? He did right by me. I know about it, but can I trust him to do right? Maybe he doesn't care about the man in the bush, the person far off who lives on a desert island. Now, again, I've not met any of these people. I'm just imagining that there could be these people. Maybe he doesn't care. And we begin to exalt ourselves above and stand in judgment. And here's what's crazy is that we begin to say, because God, you don't measure up to my standard of morality. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to reject your free gift of forgiving all of my sin forever. Do you see how some might interpret that as a, wow, that is bold. That is, if, if you're wrong, that was really bold, man. That was a little bit, maybe a smidge haughty. Here's what God says. Is he being unfair? This is what he says in Romans 1, 18. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people. That's everybody. Let's talk about everybody in this passage. Who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They suppress the truth. What does that mean? Let's, let's read on. They know the truth about God because he's made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God has made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature so that they have no excuse for not knowing God. See, God calls a foul and he says, hold on, hold on, hold on. There's not a human who has not experienced the reality that I exist just by looking around themselves. Like when you see the cosmos and you see the ecosystems and how there can be so many within a square mile and you look at your own anatomy and you look at the beautiful design that God has put around you. God says, you may suppress that in your own heart, but everybody instinctively knows that there is a creator, but it even gets worse. The judgment is worse because then he goes on in chapter two to say, not only can everybody see that there's a God, but everybody has a conscience with the law of God written on their heart. What that means is everybody knows like their conscience, at least at first, smites them when they do something pretty wicked. Like even if you don't even know any of God's ways, you go kill somebody, most of us are like, whoa, I'm feeling like that was wrong. You go steal from somebody, you go mistreat somebody, there's gonna be something, unless you resist it long enough, it's gonna tell you, it's a little knock on your door that says, hello, this doesn't make any sense maybe to you at all if there's not a God, but there is a moral objective law that you have broken and knock, 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 I'm telling you about it. So what does the scripture say? There's two witnesses in everybody's life that screams there is a God, he is not hiding. It is obvious that he is there. And while we can probably learn over time to suppress it enough that we kind of talk ourselves into other ideas, and I'm not dissing that, I'm not saying people don't have actual uh, intellectual concerns about God and, and that kind of thing. All I'm saying is, what he says is, from the beginning, everybody has a level at least of understanding that there actually is a God. And Jesus offers a solution. He says, don't work harder. Embrace the antidote that I've already given you in my death and resurrection. God is not hiding. Some of you have heard of Helen Keller. When she was 19 months old, she contracted some kind of disease that forbid her from being able to speak. She couldn't hear and she couldn't see. Very dark world. Until Ann Sullivan came along, her teacher, who was teaching her how to communicate. And one day, Ann was getting her to write the word God. And Helen said, who's, who's God? And says, Anne says, oh, it's the creator. It's the one who made everybody. And Helen responded, oh, that's his name. I've always known he was here. I just didn't know what to call him. What did Helen Keller have? Even though she had very little light, she had a response to the light she had. And my friends, we don't all have the same light on this planet. 
And throughout history, we have not all had the same light, but we have some, at least that's what the book of Romans just told us. And the question is, how will we respond to the light we have? See, God has set everybody up. He set us up to seek after God and find him. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, even if you're not a part of a culture that even knows the gospel, there's something, you're, there's, a, there's a seek that God put down on the inner man and says, seek for God, look for God, ask for God. In fact, it even says this in the scripture, Acts 17, 26, from one person, God made all nations who live on earth and he decided when and where every nation would be. You ever wonder who, like how did God decide which nations would be where and how, you know, what times they would be in and what, what would, how that would work? God has done all this so that we will look for him and reach out and find him. He isn't far from any of us. God says, true seekers, if you will respond to the light you have, God says, I'll reward it with greater understanding, greater knowledge of the truth. If you recognize there is a God, if you look at your hands and you look at the animals and you look at the people around you and you look at the way that humans are so beautiful and different than every other thing and you say, there must be a God somewhere. I don't know all of the ins and outs of it, but there is something that made all this and made me, and I can tell when I, when I displease him by the way I do things wrong. If you were to say that, God says, if you just reach out, I've placed you strategically on this planet. I've given you the circumstances you have, whatever they are, that are gonna cause you to say, to decide, I'm either gonna reach out and respond to that seek, or I'm gonna resist it and serve other things and serve myself and serve idols. God says, dude, I'm just telling you, if you just reach out, just reach out a little bit, you're gonna bump into me. And I'm gonna send truth. I'm gonna send true speakers. I'm gonna send stuff to find you, to get you, to inform you. That's what he did with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. You remember this? This is a Roman centurion. He doesn't know all the ways of the gospel. He doesn't know the ways of Jesus. He just knows what he knows. And he's like responding to this. And the Lord sends him a message. I've been watching you. I know all about you. I'm sending my servant to explain the rest of it to you. I believe that happens all the time. We just don't know. We, do, we don't see it. We don't hear about it. And really, God's not even limited to human voices. There's a man, there was a man by the name of Nabil Qureshi. He's passed away now, but he wrote an incredible book that you should read. It's called Seeking Allah and Finding Jesus. I guess it's so good because he grew up in a Muslim home. It was a really good home. In fact, it'll probably destroy some prejudices of some if you'd read this book. It was a great family. But one of the things that they like to do is they like to nitpick with Christians. And Nabil, as a young man, would be like, Christians are so dumb, man. Like he, he would just shatter all of their arguments. He'd be like, here's why Islam is true and Christianity isn't true. And he just had the worst opinion about Christians until he met a friend named David. And David was different than everybody else because he had solid, good answers for everything that Nabil said. In fact, his faith began to shake and he began to, over the years of interaction with David, he began to come to the conclusion, I'm reading the Quran, but there's inconsistencies here. And this Muhammad that we're all supposed to respect on such a great level, I see that actually he, he was pretty violent. And I see actually there's things that make him severely not respectable. And then he began to read the New Testament. And so he gets to this point where he says, God of Jesus, if you're real, I would just want to know, would you do something to get my attention? And Nabil tells the story in the book. He had this dream where the Lord essentially communicated to him, what you're serving is a dead thing and Jesus is a living thing and you need to serve him with your whole heart. Guys, if you YouTube uh, visions or dreams of people finding Jesus from other religions, you'll find a ton. This happens all the time where God says, they're, they're someplace far off and they've sought me and now boom, I'm gonna send revelation. I'm trying to be found. I'm trying to help people come back to Jesus Christ. Are we hearing that? So what about those who don't know his name? Well, I mean, I think we can infer this from the Bible. And again, I can't say what God hasn't said, but I can tell you what he has said. God says in Romans chapter three and into chapter four, um, all the Old Testament believers who trusted God they didn't know the name of Jesus, but it was by Jesus that they were saved. Why they had right standing was because they put their faith in God to the degree that they understood it and said, God, I just, I just trust you. Whatever needs to happen for you to save me, I just trust you. I trust that you take care of my sin problem, not me take care of my sin problem. So I think it's reasonable at least to infer, dude, God isn't looking for a magic word. He's not looking for a spell that someone casts. He says, I'll take it. You're gonna trust me. You don't have to know his name. Dude, he died on the cross for you just the same. You just, just reach out and say, I can't solve this. Creator God, save me. 
And God says, you won't have to wait two seconds, man. I'm on it because what am I trying to do? I desire all men to be saved. I'm trying to get to you, not trying to keep you away. Is everybody hearing that? Some of you that um, like those things, I just want to encourage you. Amens are really helpful to the preacher. So um, don't, you know, don't be ashamed. Hey, listen to what this says, Job 34.10. So listen to me. You men who have understanding, God would never do what is evil. The mighty one would never do what is wrong. Here's what we're going to find. God is fair. God is just. No one is going to walk into heaven and shake their fist at God and be like, I can't believe how unfair you were. That's not going to happen. Hey, when's that going to happen? The answer is never. That's never going to happen. In fact, we see in the book of Revelation, we have a lot of scenes happening in heaven. And so these people have a different perspective than we have. And here's what we find, especially in places like Revelation 15.3. The people who are there, who now their, their sight isn't hindered, like they get the plan on a bigger level, they're saying, true and just are your ways. And they're singing it again and again and again. What, what is that saying? It says, when you're in heaven, you see the larger picture. You're not being like, Man, wasn't God being unfair with that situation? Didn't he kind of diss those people over there? I mean, I can't believe God responded that way. No one is saying that. Instead, they're so filled with praise, it has to come out. God, you were fair. You were just. You were true. I can't believe I didn't see it then, but I see it now. You were only ever good and just and fair and true. God, you're amazing. God is gonna, it's gonna turn out, my friends, when you and I see it, oh God, I'm sorry, I ever doubted your justice. You're the one who teaches what justice is. So do I believe that God loves me? Are most religions really mostly the same? Is God really being unfair? Here's the fourth question. Can I trust God's heart when I don't comprehend his purposes? Can I trust God's heart when I don't comprehend his purposes? God, God tried to tell us this through Isaiah 55, verse eight and nine. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God says, I have a competence that you cannot begin to grasp. So can you trust my heart, and can you trust my competence? When I need to be adjusted in my back, I go to my brother, Nick. He's a chiropractor, and when he's adjusting me, I never give him coaching. I never be like, hey, Nick, that's okay, but why don't you do it this way? You know why? Because his competence compared to mine is so different. He has categories of understanding that I don't know those categories are even there, but he has significant understanding about it. God is the same way. God has understanding of categories that you and I don't even know about. There were two pastors when I was a young Christian that were really influential on my life. But because I was a young, prideful little whippersnapper, they would make decisions sometimes and be like, I don't know why they did that. <laughs> they couldn't have been very smart. But then I became a pastor and I'd be, I pastored for a few years. And I began to realize those men who I was like questioning some of the things that they did, now that I was in the kinds of things that they were in, I was noticing, wow, Carter, you are so prideful. You didn't even have a clue about the tensions that they were facing. You didn't even understand some of the things that were just normally up, up against them. And yet, maybe they made it look so easy because they were so much more full of the Holy Spirit's fruit than you were. They were able to be kind even when the world was, had them in significant pinches that you can't even really, you couldn't grasp at that time. See, now, they're only humans, and yet their proficiency and competency was so far beyond mine, even though they're not even all that much older than me. How much greater is God's competency and proficiency to run his universe greater than yours and mine if we had the silliness to weigh in on such a thing? We who don't even know all the categories. Are we hearing this? Oh, friends, it's a message on humility. It's a message on you're not God. Um, hello, can you even make dirt, yo? I'm just, I'm just asking. Like God makes galaxies. I mean, just speak it. Can you make some dirt? All right, then, then let's take you off the field, okay? All right, let's leave the cosmic reigning and ruling and judging and deciding what happens to someone who's a little bit more competent to do it. Here's the question. Will I trust God's son? Will I trust 
God's son? That's the question for everybody. For God did not send, here's what we know about God's heart. For all that we don't know, here's what we know. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And here's where we have to have a little bit of fear and trembling, okay? For those of us who maybe, we don't know for sure, we're not, we, we don't know. Um, you have been given the privilege of living in a nation where you have great access to the message of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's just start there. You've been given that. And if you resist that, um, I just, I'm afraid for you, honestly. And I don't mean that to diss you. I'm just saying, because imagine the person in the bush, okay? I know we're just using that as a, an avatar of sorts, but imagine them, imagine you and that person meet God on the same day and they had this much light and they didn't know what you know. They didn't have access to Bibles like you do. They didn't have access to much. All they said was, I don't know, maker, save me. I gotta tell you, dude, on that day, I'd much rather be him than be you because you had all this access you had all these resources and you repudiated what the king of heaven had given you? I'm just saying, where do we need to start? Humility. The gospel should bring humility. It says to us, you are not enough and you need Jesus to save you. So let me ask you, what's in your way? Like what would keep you from saying, Jesus, I can't know everything, but I know enough. I'm gonna be childlike. I'm not here to solve religion, I'm here to cling to Jesus Christ, because wouldn't it be crazy for you to have un unnecessary, unresolved tension between you and your master when you didn't need to because his hand was outstretched to you to bring you in for a warm embrace? Let's bow our heads. God, what a privilege it is for us even to just be around the truth of your word and have so much access to it. Even, people, even though people do wacky things and things that are off, even so you've not left yourself without a witness. And so we just invite you in our lives to grant us humility, to recognize again that, um, yeah, you're a, we're a little smart, but we're not God. And there's just things that are way past our understanding. And God, would you use us to help other people see the beauty of the light that they do have instead of cursing the light that maybe somebody else doesn't. In Jesus' name, amen.